Jason for the late start uh, by 15 minutes. Uh, uh, in the world of technology, sometimes uh, you can't avoid um, technical glitches like this. So uh, I would like to apologize for our starting late. We'll just get into it. Let me start with my, by introducing myself. I am Rahila Thomas, um, the Country Director for Energy Market and Rates Consultants Limited. We are independent consultants uh, providing techno-economic energy markets, regulatory, transaction ad advisory, and financing advice for electricity, renewables, and gas to power sector clients. We are a member of the MRC group of companies worldwide. Um, I welcome again um, to this I welcome again to this uh, webinar, all our online participants who have taken time out of their busy schedules, join us this morning as we discuss the new legal landscape of the power sector. We need to have this discussion of four distinguished power women who are representing key stakeholders in electricity generation, transmission and distribution, the public and the private sector. So, um, it would be a very, very interesting and insightful uh, discussion. Of course, some people may wonder about uh, a webinar being all women and, and female in the face of the need to promote diversity. I would like you all to see that the spillover from last month's International Women's Day uh, themed uh, embracing equity. So let me first, let me introduce my first panelist, uh, Dolakpo Kukoi, who is the Managing partner at Detail Commercial Solicitors, who uh, we are co hosting this webinar. Um, she leads the firm's energy infrastructure and power practice and has extensive experience advising clients on a wide range of complex transactions. Her professional experience spans across energy, project development, project finance, infrastructure development and finance, corporate commercial transactions, and mergers and acquisition. She's one of the leading energy lawyers in Nigeria, having worked for government agencies, regulators, and private parties, institutional investors, and financing institutions. Dolapo combines her strong legal background, industry knowledge to add value to each transaction, and her attention to the intricacies of every brief sets her apart as a pillar of support to clients. Dolakpa is also an avid speaker and thought leader and is passionate about encouraging the advancement of women in professional and business circles and increasing energy access in Nigeria and across Africa by leveraging private finance with the use of viable business and project models. You're welcome, Dolakpa. My next panelist is um, Olajumoke Delano. He is the head of regulatory and government relations at the Abuja Electricity distribution company. She's a highly skilled, hands-on lawyer with expertise addressing the legal, regulatory, and policy issues affecting large, complex organizations in Africa. She's a multi-jurisdictional lawyer. She is qualified to practice in Nigeria, the United Kingdom, and the state of, of New York in America. She has over 27 years of experience in various sectors, including legal, banking, energy, and infrastructure. Olaju Moke is an expert in legal advisory, energy regulation, infrastructure development, public-private partnerships, projects and transaction structuring, transforming state-owned enterprises, governance, compliance, impacts and documentation within emerging markets. Olaju Moke, I welcome you to this session. The third speaker is um, Fatima Lawan Mukta, who is the, um, currently the company secretary and legal advisor of the Transmission Company of Nigeria. She has cognate experience in negotiation, sourcing and allocation of funds for large scale transmission infrastructure assets. She coordinates a team of lawyers and other professionals to provide the legal and financial framework to structure concessionary loans for transmission infrastructure expansion in line with TCN vision and strategic goals. In addition to her role in transmission infrastructure development, she also ensures that transmission assets are operated in line with extant regulatory codes and statutes. She has a proven track record of providing expert legal 
regulatory and compliance advice to executive management and the board on critical investments and infrastructures needed. Thank you, Fatima, for coming. You're welcome. And the last speaker on the panel Thank you. is Dr. Hello. Joy Ogadi. Uh, the last speaker on the, on the panel is Dr. Joy Ogadi. She is currently the MD CEO of the Association of Power Generation Companies in Nigeria. She is a well rounded legal and corporate practice professional with over 20 years of proven and progressive managerial experience in various aspects of commercial corporate law, such as oil and gas, power, energy, transaction, regulatory matters, with a very strong work ethic. She has huge experience with corporate governmental authorities and regulatory agencies. She's a preponderance. She is currently the CEO and Executive Secretary of the Association Managing 26 Generating Companies and she's interfacing with various stakeholders associated with the power generation companies in Nigeria. Distinguished ladies, I welcome you to this panel. And thank you for, um, um, you know, I, I thank you for coming and sorry that we had to start this session late due to the technical issues. Um, let me um, now discuss, the, give, give context to the, discussion that the panelists will um, have uh, around the uh, changing legal landscape of Nigeria. I'd like to start off first with the evolution of the Nigeria electricity supply industry. We started in 2005 with the EPSHA, the electric, the electric Power Sector Reform Act that, that uh, was issued in 2005. With this act issued, a lot has happened since 2005. The Act has brought about an independent regulatory commission, it established the Rural Education Agency, established the Nigerian Electric Liability Management Company, and so many other institutions, regulatory instruments, codes, and um, orders that have helped to shape the operations in the power sector. We have been undergoing reform since 2001 when the initial national power policy was established. Um, recently, the Senate Committee on Power uh, took the lead to now um, put in place an electricity bill that would repeal the Electric Power Sector Reform Act with the mind that uh, we have come a long way in the reform of the power sector and there's a need to bring about an electricity act that would uh, be much more encompassing um, and would consolidate the laws relating to the Nigerian electricity supply industry, provide a comprehensive legal and institutional framework for the power sector in Nigeria in the areas of electricity generation, transmission, system operation, distribution, supply, trading, enforcement of consumer rights and obligations. The electricity bill is also envisioned to provide for a holistic integrated resource plan policy that recognizes all sources of generation and is able to include the integration of renewable energy to Nigeria's energy mix and attract investment and for related matters. So um, we have started the reform, we've gone through 19 years of reform and um, the Senate Committee on Power that, start, that you know, took the leadership in uh, bringing about this electricity bill um, today is currently trying to um, seek concurrence with the lower chamber of the National Assembly to pass this bill. Despite the reforms that have started leading up to privatization, which is supposed to be a transformative thing, the Nigeria electricity supply industry today is still plagued by lack of investment poor infrastructure and high losses leading to frequent power outages and limited access to electricity for many Nigerians. Last month, an act to alter certain provisions. Last month, an act to alter certain provisions of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to allow states to generate, transmit, and distribute electricity 
in areas covered by the national grid and for related matters came into force. This is widely believed to have the potential to transform the electricity industry. Under the previous system, the federal government held a monopoly on the regulation of the entire electricity value chain in Nigeria. This centralized approach has been criticized in many quarters for being the key factor that has led to the slow development of the Nigerian power sector. Therefore, the recent constitutional amendment is a major shift in government in participation in the electricity sector and has the potential to increase generation capacity and access to electricity, improve reliability, and attract much needed investment in the sector. Given this background, I would like to go straight to the panelists, and I would like to start with uh, the Lapo Kukoi, uh, who um, jointly we supported the Senate committee in uh, drafting the electricity bill 2022. Delapo, you're welcome. Um, given your participation and support to the Senate committee on this uh, electricity bill, I uh, would like to uh, hear from you what this electricity bill 2022 would usher in if it is enacted. What are the key highlights of the bill? and how these will impact the Nigeria electricity supply industry. You have five minutes, please, to provide your contribution. Thank you. Zolapa? Thank you, Rahila, and um, great to be here. I hope everyone Okay. You can hear me. Thank you. Yes, I can um, hear you. So I'm just right. going to share slides. Um, okay, I'm just going to share slides on highlights of the bill, um, and hope this leads into the third discussions. Minutes. I'm just going to yes, just to say that um, highlights of what the bill is. Okay, in the course of our work, you know, just assessing the bill um, when it was in its initial drafts, um, what we basically did was kind of like go through a process of a diagnostic, you know, of where the power sector is and um, a lot of the things that had caused in the past, um, would I say, and a lot of things that all the judicial precedents, you know, uh, given that we are a growing sector, I even anticipate with, with recent changes that but we will still have to announce you know, um, but but where, where we, what we tried to do in our advice in terms of a diagnostic process was kind of bring the law to a place where would hopefully not necessitate too many changes and could set some kind of institutional framework for us to build up on. So with that background, um, I'm not to walk through the all of the slides that I have, but just touch on key things that you hopefully would see when this bill is passed into law um and even with the with the recent changes with the constitution maybe there would be there would be even be further changes you know from what I, I must give a caveat that this this presentation is based on the last draft of the bill that we've seen as you know with with um legislative action that is a parallel process and sometimes practitioners like ourselves don't see what's happening in that process so you may see something different, but I hope not too widely different. In, in, in terms of institutional issues, one of the things that was proposed in the bill is to kind of whittle down the internal powers of the Minister of Power. And that's to kind of give the, the regulator NERC on the federal level, you know, autonomy. And in, in that sense, also make it clear that with certain decisions, rather than saying that the minister would, you know, um, the minister would be required to hold prior consultations, which really already happens. But I thought that I, I think that what we're thinking about is when you make it very clear in the law, then you know, um for that ministers, future ministers are, are likely to follow that. Also, 
özellikle number the which is very 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 also that will have to actually prosecute offenses you know of it I'm just waiting for my slide to change. One of the major things issues that I've had since privatization up till now was, you know, our market stages. You know, what stage of the market are we supposed to be in? What are the prerequisites for those stages of the market? You know, uh, and the, the fact is that obviously things haven't really gone as the law pretended, you know, and then NERC used the market rules as a stopgap you know, to be able to deal with intervening issues that happened, not exactly as the law pretended. But that this also led to um, a lot of court cases where, you know, participants in the market would say that oh, we are not supposed to be in this stage, but minister has said that we're in this stage, but we are not ready and all of that. So I think what, what, what the bill just says here is try to make things clearer and vesting NERC with that responsibility to ensure a phase-wide development of the market from its current transitional stage to the medium stage market, you know, um, to try to align the provisions of the EPSRA currently today with that of the market rules so that there's some kind of um, holistic direction. Um, the, the bill also recognizes electricity as beneficiaries of the um, competition tra um, tra transition charge. And it also spells out, you know, uh, what embed's role in the market will be, how long it, well, not, not in terms of years, but given that it should be phased out by the medium stage. We all already know, you know, that um, in terms of um, embed's role, even though it's not, a, <laughs> I'm sure that Joy will have a lot to say in this respect, you know, how it's going to be and how it's going to turn out. We know that embed has maybe two, three years. Um, how that is going to run, we don't know yet, but uh, the bill actually spells out the fact that by the time we get to medium stage, embed rules should be phased out. I'm sure my my our trans um the 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 bill delineates you know the process of establishing an ISO you know and delineates what the ISO will cover. Interesting um. Developments net and for investment in transmission network by this sense kind and also it's a basis for and state government to enter into PPP arrangements. I think that with the constitutional change now, that's an interesting private dynamic company network that we hope to see. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Delaco, for that. Uh, thing that has created Delaco, your, your connection is Oh, you can't. Delaco, your connection is quite me. bad. I'm so sorry. Yes, the beat um, the patch. Um, if you perhaps. Yes, a bit patchy. Oh, so sorry Wait, about. We, we couldn't see here. Okay, now you better. You, I, you, have one, you have one minute. Sean, without sharing anything. Yes. I'll stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Jalako, for your connection. It's uh, bad, perhaps. Uh, you want to switch uh, service provider. It's really, really quacky. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, hope that, um, I mean, the tent assembly uh, will be, uh, the tent um, assembly will be uh, the expectation that, you know, they will come in uh, by after the new, uh, the, the new administration is inaugurated. Uh, the expectation is that this electricity bill will be passed, is uh, currently in the House for uh, concurrence with the lower chambers. We hope that when this is done, 
we sent to the president for assent and uh, hopefully passed for us to have a new uh, act that governs the operations of the power sector. Um, what I would like us to get into now is really the uh, constitutional amendments. Um, the second schedule, part two, concurrent legislative list of the 1999 constitution state in section 13, um, that the National Assembly may make laws for the federation or any part thereof with respect to electricity and the establishment of electric power stations. Uh, on the screen, uh, you have that part of the, uh, the, the amendment that took place. I'm sure everyone can see it. Uh, I'd like to, on the, on the back of this, I'd like to ask you, Jumoke, um, that what this really implies uh, for distribution. Uh, what we see here from this uh, provision is that the electricity distribution is solely under the purview of the state and generation and transmission is that of the federal government. With the amendment, the state will become more active. How do you see this playing out, given that uh, not all states will be concurrently active? I mean, right today we see that some states are way ahead, you know, uh, you know like Lagos State, of course. Uh, Kaduna has things they are doing, equity state, um, Akwai bomb. So for discourse covering more than one state, how do you see this playing out? For Abuja Disco, for example, you have four states. So what are your thoughts on this? How will this play out, given the provision of this uh, constitutional amendment? So thank you, Rahila. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. Thank you. OK, so thank you for the invitation. And um, good morning to my co-panelists. It's my pleasure and privilege you know, to be at this session. So uh, this is a, I would say that these are very interesting times for the electricity supply industry in Nigeria, and of course, catalyzed by this recent constitutional amendment, you know, that empowers states to enact laws for generation, distribution, and transmission to all areas within the state. So while previously uh, there was a restriction where they were not allowed to transmit and distribute in areas covered by the national grid. Now they have free reign of all the areas within their state, you know, to enact, you know, these laws. Now, it's interesting that while this um, constitutional amendment is taking place, uh, it's not a silver bullet. It's been assented to by the president. But well, what does a state need to do in order to actualize you know, the intent of the amendment. So they have to see the right. Will all the states take advantage of it? That remains to be seen. Of course, as you mentioned, some states are already on the forefront of you know, either amending you know, legis existing legislation or even developing new ones that are going through the process of being passed in order to actualize it. So for a state to be able to benefit from this uh, constitutional amendment, they need to create, you know, policies for electricity, for creating an electricity market within that state, considering the peculiarities, the advantages that the state has, you know, the natural endowments, you know, in developing a policy and integrated electricity plan, you know, for the state. Now, from the policy, you now, of course, need to enact a law because the constitutional amendment will not automatically take effect. So you need to enact a law that provides the framework for the development of the state electricity market. And you know, different scenarios are, you know, are, are, are possible where the state is a player, where the state is an enabler for PPP projects, the public-private partnerships, as mentioned by the LACO, states providing catalytic funding to make projects bankable. So there's a lot that can be done. But you know, a law needs to be in place, or where they already have a law, like Lagos had the Lagos State uh, uh, Reform Law, you could amend the law or you know, create a new one in order to um, maximize this benefit. Of course, then the agencies, the regulators, you know, that would ensure that this um, implement the framework that you know has been provided and create this electricity market. So I would say that. Bearing in mind this amendment, there's no real need to invent the wheel because the process of electrification takes time, it's quite expensive, 
So do you want to, do states want to reinvent the wheel because they now have these uh, powers? I think it's better for them to consider, you know, evaluating what is available and, you know, deciding with the key stakeholders, stakeholders how to build upon the resources that are already available that already exist within the states. Now, for distribution companies that exist, you know, across states, I mean, there's a whole, there's some distribution companies that cover even six states. You know, the ideas have been mooted that they could possibly evolve to having a holding structure where the distribution company is the holding company, but different entities now exist within the different states that will now be subject to the laws, you know, that, you know, emanate from these uh, states by virtue of the powers that have been given to them under the constitutional amendment. So you would have a holding company, distribution company, whilst, you know, you have subsidiaries in the different states. And, you know, this could also provide potential opportunities for investors, you know, to come into these subsidiary companies and invest, or even the state, depending on what the framework, the enabling framework, you know, that has been created. Now, I see that it is important, you know, for stakeholder engagement to continue. Collaboration and stakeholder engagement is key and is required at different levels. Now, as these states start to decide they want to create their laws, it's good to engage with the federal regulator and the existing market participants in order to develop an environment that will indeed um, attract investments into those states and not an area where the law is so jumbled up and unclear that investors will be wary of even investing in such uh, states. Now, that's uh, collaboration at the level of enacting the laws. What about between, with respect to the law that will eventually come out of the National Assembly that Jolako mentioned? There needs to be stakeholder engagement in that also, in ensuring that it's important that it's what is envisaged you know, is realized. And then where does the role of the federal regulator end? Where does the role of the state regulator start? It's important that there is clarity, you know, across any enabling, any laws at the state level or the law that in, um, eventually emerges from the um, National Assembly, you know, so that there's clarity and, you know, it minimizes confusion and minimizes conflict and disputes. At the last level, I will also say that it's important that the market participants and the states, the licensees, industry stakeholders, must also engage, like for distribution companies that run across multiple states, they need to engage with the, um, the states that, where they are located in order to agree the way forward, in order to ensure that they do not end up in disputes in the legislation that will just slow down the whole process of electrification and creating energy access. So it's important, you know, for all um, parties, you know, stakeholders to come on board in order to fashion the way forward and make this a win-win, you know, in terms of energy access, you know, for the communities and for the states that are affected. Thank you, Rahila. Thank you, Jumake. I mean, definitely, no doubt. Uh, collaboration is key. Um, I mean, I, I like the point you make about uh, having a holding company where you have subsidiaries across the states. Uh, in that sense, every state would have uh, an electricity distribution company uh, in their states to actually manage and uh, kind of work together to increase, increase energy access. Um, I mean, it's, it's sometimes, as we say, uh, the devil is in the details. So, but uh, definitely what you've said about having that, those conversations happen is very, very critical to the success of this whole uh, process. And obviously, talking about distribution, uh, transmission is critical. Uh, we have today uh, 10 transition regions, and uh, it's still 100% federal government owned. I wonder about this, uh, Fati, who is of the transmission company um, of Nigeria. Can states make a claim? You know, like, I'd like to understand. I've had um, conversations with different representatives of states 
uh, speaking about wanting to island uh, their state uh, to providing power for their citizens. And uh, even the talk about having, you know, being on the transmission infrastructure in that area. Um, given that it's 100% owned, and we know that today, uh, not all parts of the transmission grid are, uh, is fully strengthened. I mean, there's a lot of investment going, projects and all that. I wonder that when states make claim to a region to island themselves, is this even a possibility in your, in your view? Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here, Rahila, and uh, all my colleagues as well. Um, it's an interesting time, as Jumoke has said, and everyone is saying it's exciting, it's unclear, it will take a lot of navigation to get to where we want to get to. Thinking about this is that this is um, the, the constitutional amendment was only the fact that it extended to even where the national group. Um, if uh, so, in in other words, that the change was actually yes. Um, looking at the bill, if you look at the bill, uh, it says that it's the idea of having investors in transmission that's well and good. I mean, there's already a regulation in NERC about um, investing in transmission network. Um, the issue is how does an investor recoup what he's invested? Um, are the tariffs reflect cost reflective for him to recoup? I won't invest in, a, in in something I don't see getting a rate of return. So the 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 tariffs will have to be cost reflective. There will have to also be less interference. As you said, yes, we're totally government owned. The bill also appreciates the fact that um, the the wires business, the the transmission business, should be hyped up from the dispatch. There's a lot of clamor by the participants that um, the ISO should be established and that let TC and um, TSP stand on its own as well, and which is in the bill. Um, Lagos is made out of the states. I've read the bill, the two, um, 2021 Lagos bill. They've made a lot of um, progress in that area. But they've also, what they did actually is the same suggestion Jumoke had. They've actually said, we have, we're not very interested in running the wires business. What we're interested in is that you still have TCN, and then you will have, the state would have a holding company within TCN. Lagos is very lucky. I mean, 30% of our infrastructure and power goes to them. So in terms of progress, they've really progressed ahead of other states. But if you compare Lagos to the northern states, if, um, if you could... Um, Unfortunately, I don't have the map, but if you look at it, um, somewhere like where I'm from, the Northeast, is, um, it'd be very difficult for them to take up this. So it depends, states are burdened with, um, um, they're burdened with their loans already, their obligations. Going into transmission is a very, very um, cost-intensive thing. And also their um, right-of-way issues, even as federal government, we, have, we try to collaborate with states. There are a lot of states that we're trying to reconduct, but getting people out of the right-of-way for even state governments that own the land is quite challenging for them. So what I see is, yes, they can do it. How it works is that the regulator, the state regulator and the federal regulator will have to delineate rules and responsibilities. There has to be a clear delineation, if not that. And then in terms of... Um, um, how, you know, the grid is only, a, it's stronger the, it because it's more resilient if it's bigger. So the, the, um, you will still have to have a national grid. There's a tie line between, say, um, the Lagos region, if you're joining it to, say, another region. So that tie line, the law says interstate things are on the, on the exclusive thing. So you still need that. Because even as human states um, produce excess power, they will need to export it somewhere. So they need, you still need that federal thing there. They will, if, if they don't have as much, they will need to import as well. The good thing about the, um, the new bill is that it opens up to um, renewables. So for like my state, as I said, there's a lot of sunshine there. They could explore that as well and reduce the carbon footprints. Um, it's a possibility, but there's a, still a lot of work to be done to um, achieve this. For TCN, 
um, I see TCN still having a role. I see the um, regulator still having a role. But um, Jumoke, in terms of distribution, another alternative I've also thought is, because I've seen it recently in the papers, the UBA is saying it wants to sell off its shares. What I'm thinking is government should divest their shares in the distribution, and the states could actually take up and buy up those shares. Or um, as UBA is selling, is selling shares now, those states in your franchise areas can actually buy those shares as well, and then you run it. There are a lot of options that are possible. It's just that people just have to sit down and do a lot more work on it. But it's good that the conversation has started. Yeah, when you when you talk about when you talk about um, the uh, the thank you very much when you talk about the um, the state buying up the shares, uh, I mean, uh, Dumaker can speak more to this. You have uh, for the distribution company sixty percent owned by the private investors and forty percent is is government, and that forty percent I believe is representing the three tiers of government. Yes. So um, is that are we saying that uh, the federal government reduce their share um, in a way that you have the states taking more of that? And will the state uh, be able to put capital on the table when it is called for? Uh, Jumaker, what you know? What uh, would your what are your thoughts on this? So interesting thoughts, and um, I think I like the fact that there are various options, and you know. Yes. Fatima mentioned the fact that the states are, they are inundated with debt as we speak now. So does the state really want to? While they will like, they may, they may like to, can they afford to? But even they, if they can't afford to now, there are different structures that allow um, a state to have the eventual output of better energy access and better electrification. And that can be providing the enabling environment that allows investment to come in. Whether the investment is from the state or the investment is from a capable investor. You know? So I think there are different options that are certainly worth considering, which um, disco investors also will be considering at this time. That what is the best way you know, to go about achieving the end goal of energy access or better electric electrification, of course, an investor is always in, um, interested in this type of return, as um, Fatima also said. So I think um, it's open for discussion. It's open for discussion. Yeah. Do the states want to want to um, take up more, more shares? That's one. But is that the most effective role that a state can play? You know, or uh, maybe you need them to actually contribute to making projects bankable? You know, providing some form of catalytic fund, you know, so there are different dynamics, you know, to getting um, a state electricity market up and running. And I think those conversations are, are ongoing as we speak. Thank you so much, uh, Jumoke. Thanks, Patty, for your contributions there. Uh, obviously, with the state participation, uh, being able to uh, legislate and have control over generating, transmitting, and distributing power. Uh, what we will uh, eventually start to see is a state issuing licenses to generation uh, to power developers. Now, uh, the increase in generation capacity and the proliferation of generation sources are definitely bound to be the case with this amendment. Uh, Joy, Dr. Joy Ogaji, I see, I can see you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, sorry that uh, due to the technical hitches, uh, your video can't be on, but we'd love to hear from you. I uh, was speaking to the generation capacity uh, being uh, increased based on this amendment. While I see that this is a good thing, uh, I would like to understand from your perspective, uh, are, are there any concerns on your part? Um, is, there, is there a risk that the increased capacity can be stranded? And if yes, how can this be mitigated? Because today we know that um, uh, the total installed capacity is over 13,000 megawatts. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, what is being uh, distributed to, to customers today is about 4,000 megawatts. So a huge amount of that capacity is stranded. What are your concerns? I mean, I mean do you see concerns with this? And how, how can these uh, be mitigated at the state level to ensure that generation that comes on is, um, is being uh, distributed effectively? Joy. Over to you. 
Dr. Ogaji? Dr. Okaji, are you there? Okay, it seems uh, we are not uh, able to reach Joy, but I, we can we can see her, um, but she's um, not able to speak. Uh, that question obviously has an effect on distribution as well as transmission uh, to Jumoke and Fati. Um, and and Dolakpo, you're there, please. Uh, I would like to also hear from you on this aspect of generation. Um, and after you speak, you know, I would like uh, uh, Fatima and uh, Delano to speak on uh, the effect of this, because this obviously raises the issue of uh, potential misalignment. Uh, the way it should work in the power sector, you know, we should understand what the demand is and it should work upstream. So when we establish the demand, uh, transmission is there to ensure that that demand is met when generation provides for it. So in this situation where you have the states uh, being able to legislate or and, and issue licenses, we will see an increased amount of capacity, which can be on paper, not actually um, uh, live, but that will happen. So in the event that you have all these power developers going to the states and trying to get licenses to start uh, you know, producing power, how, what what are your thoughts, uh, Dolakpo? Let me start with you. What are your thoughts on that? Um, if you know, is, is there a potential fear that this will be stranded? And if that is a fear, how do you think it can be mitigated? Dolakpo, to you first, and then. And I hope everybody yes. can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. So you were saying to mention. I think we get that out of the okay. I'll just I'll just go ahead and I hope you can hear me. Um yes. So I think that we need to look at power plants will not be built to look at this it automatically in a day or in a year. There will have to be a process towards this, you know. Um, and it's the same process we are talking about with respect to how the bulk trader will be phased out. So I, I think that this will take a lot of planning and there needs to be leadership at some point, which I think should still be NERC's role to take, which is, okay, how do we, there are obviously power plants at the federal level that are supplying power. Now, the fact that states, that they supply power to states, we know that it's sufficient anyway. We know that the demand for power is. So I, I don't see this as a, I don't see this as a loser's game. I actually see it as a winner's game because what I expect to happen is that these bats, depending on their locations, should go to the states and try to offer the states mm. something that works. Now, I, I know for a fact that we are also looking at bilateral trade between certain discos and certain genkos now. So, so if we are looking at that, then I think that the risk of stranded power, except if we are are looking at physical issues or technical issues where maybe a plant is in a place where it is stranded to the point it can't get to willing customers for example you know then there may be a problem but what i what i i would say is it's something that would engender competition obviously um okay. generation companies who have been getting payments because there's an, an embed and a guarantee you know would have to sit up you know and look at their markets, and I, I think there are a few gens that are doing things. You know, look at their market, look at their customers and see how, you know, they can sell their power. Remember that power at that level is supposed to be cheaper, you know, mm -hmm. than what you do, do on the embedded to the gender competition. Key thing is this, there needs to be someone lead process. How is this going to happen? How do we, you know, how, how will the market then be restructured in the sense that um, Jenko's being able to sell to the states. The states, the states have always had the opportunity to open up their doors to investors. And this constitutional um, amendment didn't start that. They had the powers to do. How many of them have plans? So I don't think there is a. I don't think there is uh, that fear. We should, you know, put ourselves in a panic. I think that there's just a process that needs to be followed, and we need to. You know, that. Thank you. Thank you, Delacqua. Delano, do you want to make uh, your contributions on this and then party? Yes, absolutely. So can you hear me, please? 
Yes, I can. Okay, so should any generation really be stranded? I think you said it all, Rahila, that where there's no proper planning, then you have the issues of stranded generation. And just as Dolapo also said, with the energy access gap that we have in Nigeria, then there should be no issue where generation is stranded. Now, there's also, of course, the issue of um, having an integrated resource plan, you know, that somebody is overseeing and ensuring that end to end, you know, with this integrated resource plan, even for the states sharing their own plans, you know, with the federal, federal providing leadership, then you'll be, have, you'll be able to have a systematic process of ensuring that you don't result with stranded generation. And I'll speak to the stranded generation that is um, happening now and what is being done. So with the stranded generation that has been realized in the Nigerian electricity supply industry as we speak, there are investments uh, between, there's this um, intervention between uh, the transmission company of Nigeria and um, the distribution companies, the interface projects, where, and the idea is to improve the ability one of the objectives is to improve the ability of the distribution companies to evacuate power, you know, in the areas where they want more power, you know, to be allocated to. So as far as I'm concerned, it's really an issue of planning. And for you to have proper planning, of course, there needs to be leadership. With um, the options provided by the regulations also include captive power, embedded generation, interconnected or isolated guinea grid, and then traditionally sail to the grid. So with these options available, I, I don't think there will be an issue with stranded power as long as proper planning is done. Patty, do you, do you share those views? Given that you are the, you are the middle, middle person in ensuring that this power pass from uh, upstream downstream. Looking at the investments and the current situation in the market where you have SLAs and there are you know, issues with settling you know, between yourselves at TCN and the distribution companies uh, in meeting their day ahead nominations and uh, operations like that. What do you share the same view? You are muted. We can't hear you. Patty, we can't hear you. It seems you are still muted. Oh, sorry about that. I sort of missed Jumokes um, and the Lapos. They were coming in bits and pieces. I don't know if it's my connection. Uh, um, I can hear you. The option is, I, as a state, I, um, I honestly don't think states would invest. It's more um, um, not states per se, it's private people investing. In terms of uh, evacuating power, um, I honestly don't believe there's actually stranded power at this moment. Because for those that have stranded, the generators that have excess power that's not been taken is more a function of that the power is not being paid for. That's why they want to go into bilaterals, and that's why we have um, the um, eligible customer for those that have excess power to, to give up. But um, the other option would be that TCN is not everywhere. They, you, you know, the other option would be to do embedded generation for particular places. That, that would work very well for um states and um it, uh, you know the question of whether states i don't know apart from Lagos state i don't think it's um, it's a matter of just one state i think it's it's more of a couple of states coming together to form something than just a state because there are very few states that are as strong in fact there's no state as strong as Lagos state in terms of infrastructure apart from um edo that um, has a lot more um, transmission lines so in terms of stranded power, yes, embedded generation is an option. Um, secondly, is that as Jumoke says, there's the SLA um, to, to deal with transmission and distribution interfaces. There's a lot of work to be done on both sides, to be honest with you. There's, um, there's a lot of work to be done on the distribution networks as well for, for them to be able to evacuate the power that's being willed. TCN also has to also strengthen the grid as well and um, upgrade certain lines as well. We have a lot of um, the, the issues with evacuation corridors and um, the resilience. That has to be addressed. But the thing I see is the bill recognizes that the ministry will sort of lead this. At this moment, I think NERC should start the conversation. I think they should, they, they, you know, they, they has to be, 
the way it is now, there are more questions than there are answers, and somebody has to start driving this conversation. Thank you. Most certainly. Um, so, uh, I, I hear that. Dr. Joy, are you back? Um, okay, I, I don't think I, I, I saw she's back. Dr. Joy, are you there? Can you hear me? I think she's still having some connectivity issues. Dr. Gaji, are you, can you hear me? Okay, let's just go ahead. We're we are running out of time. Um, I, I can see that a lot of uh, people have posted questions on the Q&A, so I would like to start to take them, and I will, you know, um, target different participants or uh, panelists to answer the questions. Let me take the first one. Uh, I think it will come up on the screen. It's from Ruben Okoye. Uh, Ruben Okoye is asking a question. Won't state, I mean, it's on the screen, I'm sure you can see it, would, won't state's direct involvement in electrification not take us back to the NEPA scenario and undo the power sector privatization? Dolako, what are your thoughts on this question? <laughs> I'm not sure what Mr. Akwe is saying, and maybe he's saying, maybe he's pointing to the capacity of the states. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's what he's pointing to. And I think that this is where we are still looking to have a leader or a, a point person in directing this entire process. It's going to be a reiteration process, obviously standards need to be met and 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 on the, uh, this this doesn't pretend to say that the state the, the federal level loses abdicates its responsibility mm -hmm. anybody who is in the business is first under the federal laws that states cannot do this doesn't mean that federal laws don't exist to meet those standards so so if we are saying okay the fact that states can go into distribution you know um would that mean that we will be subjected to certain inefficiencies, for example? Then there needs to be some kind of um, standard setting in terms of what it is. And I think that that is already on the federal level. So it will be, it yeah. will be great for the states to at least follow what's on the federal level and build on it. You understand? Now, there will, there will now be issues around, you know, who is going to go after the states if the state doesn't perform? Yes. You understand? Yes. That I cannot, I cannot tell you. Yeah. So, so that that would be my response. When you think, uh, when you think about it today, uh, when you talk about uh, state direct involvement in electrification, they are involved at off grid because the uh, concurrent list allows them to participate in that off grid, and that is the essence of the renewable energy um, uh, rural electrification agency anyway to work with every state in ensuring energy access and you know, taking power to people that are, are not uh, uh, on the grid. So today, as it stands, the states are participating in rural uh, in electrification process through the Rural Electrification Agency. And, and for those that have electricity uh, state boards, that is part of what they are doing. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, um, it will take us back. I think uh, if things are well coordinated, managed, it should actually strengthen um, uh, the power sector and provide more um, uh, increased energy access to those that are that are off grid and and have no access to energy. But did you want to uh, make your comments on the fact that um, I mean somebody just posted? Let me um, say they, they talked about uh, this is Ihoma. Sorry, apologies if I didn't call it properly. Ihoma in Wibu. Uh, the position here is, what is the position, I'll put it up, what is the position of the electricity bill with respect to the constitutional amendment, to what extent will it be relevant when states begin to make its own electricity laws? I think this is to you, Dolapo. So the electricity bill, I think the question here is that, you know, uh, with, what, with respect to this constitutional amendment, what is the relevance if the electricity bill is passed. Do they align? Is there a misalignment? Does it strengthen 
uh, I mean, the constitution, the constitution is above uh, every other uh, act. The mm -hmm. participant is trying to understand that. Okay, Th thanks, Ihoman. Thanks, Rahila. I, 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 I think that there will be alignment. I think that, and I think that whilst the, the bill was being retreated, this constitutional bill came up. It wasn't then an act. Yeah. Um, so you would see that in certain in certain places, for example, the last slide before I went off, it says that even in transmission, states and federal can enter into PPPs with private operators. So it kind of envisaged that. And I think that there are other parts in the bill that envisage it. So what I had said when I was making the presentation was that we may even see more changes before it becomes an act. But at, at where the bill now is, I don't think that there will be conflict, but I envisage that we will have reiterations or tests of what the act says. Hopefully people won't go to court, but some states may go to court, you know, if they feel very strongly about it, that would then kind of hopefully bring us to an alignment of how, how things should work. But as the bill stands now, it's not in direct conflict. There may be more changes. Sure. Okay, um, that's, uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, uh, countries including today, countries including the United States, Australia, India, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico have separate state and federal regulatory organizations that perform different functions. In the states, Australia and India, for example, the federal regulatory agencies oversee the federal transmission system, while the state regulatory agencies control retail electricity distribution inside the individual states. Uh, there's a clear de de definition of roles in other countries where both federal and state regulators exist. For NESI, who will define those roles? Now, if, uh, I would like, uh, Fatih, I'd like your thoughts on this. Uh, you know, when, you looked at the, when we looked at the second, the second schedule on the concurrent list, um, it's, it's clearly stated that the National Assembly can legislate uh, with respect to generation and transmission. In that section, there is no reference to distribution. And when you go to the House of Assembly in section 14 of the same uh, section, it says that they can, the, the state can legislate, legislate with respect to generation, transmission, and distribution. Now, in your view, do you think that transmission should solely be at the federal level? and not have state involvement. What are your thoughts on this? Because right now, they, they, I mean, you are all lawyers on, on the panel. Right now, there seems to be a, a suggestion that uh, the state, based on the provisions of this uh, amendment and even the constitution, the federal have no right to legislate on retail electricity distribution as uh, and, and transmission and generation should be at the federal level. You know, what are your thoughts on these legally? You know, what anticipate would happen? You know, what are your uh, thoughts on this? Um, thank you. So, yeah, so earlier on, I said the only difference the amendment made was in terms of extending places to where the national grid is. The truth is that it's always been there that distribution is a matter for the states to handle. Somehow, everybody missed it, and NERC is now regulating distribution, and you don't have straight, straight regulators. What happens is, as they say, um, if there's a lacuna, someone steps in. There's nobody, NERC takes over. If states now decide that they want to deal with the distribution, yes. And honest truth is that I see states buying transformers and you know reinforcing distribution lines. So. Um, why shouldn't they, if they're already doing this, they should find some legal way of being um, recognized. Um, uh, the truth is, it's not, I don't think states are really going to, very few states are going to be able to come into this arena at this moment. I, if I was a state governor in some states, I, I would wait for federal government to go and reinforce the transmission for me. Why would I invest if someone else is willing to do it, really? I mean, the cost is, is so high. Um, for those clamoring to, to do um, these laws now is that because they already have infrastructure put in by the federal government, they're not talking about putting in new transmission infrastructures because they, if you look at the states that are now saying this, they already, most of them already have um, a certain degree of investment in their states in terms of transmission. 
So for those states that do not have that, that degree of infrastructure in terms of transmission, I'll just wait for government to come. Or if, of course, I can afford, I can I will license private investors. But the truth is, well, private investors want to come to certain states because the rate of return might not be so appealing. Of course. Delano, one minute on this and uh, we'll move on to another participant question. Okay, um, for me, I think it's really, there's a need for clarity um, and any laws that would be enacted going forward must make it clear so that there is no, no confusion. On the issue of uh, distribution, of course, it's clear based on what the constitutional amendment says. But what about the states that you know choose not to, you know, even activate this? As Fatima has said, what happens? So there's a possibility that they are still going to be controlled under the under the um, federal regulator. So there is need for a lot of clarity going forward in the enactments that will emerge from the National Assembly and State House of Assembly. I mean, I, on the screen, we can see here from uh, Wola Joseph. She, she's saying that she does not think that the constitutional amendment envisages the state going into generation, transmission, and distribution. Um, she believes that uh, the idea is for them to create an enabling environment uh, to come into their state and invest in their areas. I mean, I, I'm not a lawyer, probably a pocket lawyer, uh, but um, I, I, what I read seems to suggest that states can actually legislate and they can actually participate in this. So is there like a difference? Is, is the amendment saying that you can only legislate and they can't, you know, build? I mean, you have states building generation plan. Um, so, I, mean, I don't say, know. Okay, so I would like to say that you may have a right to do something, but that doesn't mean you have to do yeah, it yourself. Yeah. So I think that is the idea I, that is being explained. That once you have a right, are you the best in the? Are you best suited, you know, to carry out the assignment yourself, or will it be better for you to engage a more capable partner to um, to carry out that assignment? And I think that's why. Uh, the speaker, Wola, is alluding to the fact that if you are not best placed, then bring in competent people, you know, to do it. Because the, what is the eventual objective and end goal? Is it economic development? Yeah. Is it energy access? Then if you are, if the state, and I think that was what uh, Mr. Okoye was also alluding to, that by the time states start running um, distribution companies, are they ever able to do it better? Than, um, than uh, the private sector. So why not create an environment that allows people to come and invest and do what they know to do best, rather than the state doing it itself? Hmm. Makes perfect sense. Um, uh, Dean, there's a comment from Dean Tolebo, and he's asking, do new generating companies need to get approvals from both state regulators and NERC for new projects? Or, it's saying here, let me see if I'm complete. Um, it says, do new generating companies need to get approvals for both state regulators and NERC for new projects, or will one approval or the other be enough to operate? And it's interesting that Dean asked that question because it was one of my, my questions here where I, where I talked about um, if state regulators license other distribution utilities in addition to the 13 that we have today, 11 and then we have ABA and IBOM who, that recently joined, because this would imply that the current discos may lose some of their customers within the franchise area, which will reduce their energy offtake. Now, is that, what is the potential impact of this scenario on existing PPAs? And the second part was, would current JENCOs require state operating licenses in addition to the generation licenses from NERC? I mean, I think, Dolako, the, the second part of that question, I'd like you to make comment on it. And uh, Delano, what you think about this issue of states, you know, um, giving licenses to new distribution companies who obviously are going to compete with your customers, reduce uh, uh, your pie, as it were, and obviously that would have impact 
on your verily. Is that do you see that playing out and um, how would it work out? Okay, so good question because um the um constitutional amendment gives the states the right, but have they done it? So laws the a state that does not have a law, you know, does not have an enabling framework or environment, where does that requirement for a license come from? So the state needs to create its policy, needs to enact its laws, create its agencies, and then process, you know, evolves in that in that format. So that's what's happening. And then you cannot apply a law, you know, retrospectively. So whatever law you is enacted is enacted going forward. It's not enacted, you know, to affect those that were already in existence and in operation before the law took effect. Thanks, Rahila. I see. Thank you. Uh, Delapo, your thoughts? Delapo? So, so I, 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 think, I think that democracy is need um, pilot because I have for scholars to say and this constitution might be the state and law and I speak to your drum because it was made up Sorry, sorry, uh, your your connection is you're a bit patchy. We can't hear you very well. It's a bit patchy. Hello, can you hear me? Delapo. Can you? Yes. Delapo, I think you are frozen. Uh, if you, we will, um, we'll come back to you. Um, Patty, in terms of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the uh, chat, no. unfortunately, Dr. Dara Gaji couldn't join us because of her connection, but she did make a comment, uh, which I feel is aligned with what Patty said earlier. She said, and I read, that only a few states like Lagos, Aquibom, only a few states like Lagos, Aquibom, Edo might be able to participate in all aspects of the value chain. Because of the capital intensive nature of such projects, they will still need to collaborate with existing providers to serve their states. I believe that but this is the point you're raising earlier about uh, you know, states using existing infrastructure and not you know, uh, trying to build parallel lines that will cost a fortune. And obviously, uh, people need to also understand that whatever capital is put out there is passed through to you and I as customers, and you know, it, it pushes electricity tariffs uh, through the roof. So I think she's in alignment with what uh, Patia said earlier about the, the fact that this project is capital intensive and um, um, it might be better to use existing infrastructure and collaborate with existing players to see how they can facilitate a better environment for operation. She also said that while it is okay to carry the review of extra, uh, there are burning questions. One of such questions, have we established a reasonable basis for the amendment? Uh, I think this can take into a legal battle, but we will hang on to that. Um, up on the screen, uh, uh, what uh, I have put up are subsector challenges, and uh, I would like Fati to go first. Um, you know, the question here is: What are the what are the chances that this new legal landscape will help resolve the sector challenges? Uh, how do you see state governments responding to this new law in this regard? What would be your expectation as uh, a transmission company of Nigeria for the state to improve the current situation? So how do you see, what would you expect uh, the state to do in working with you as a transmission company of Nigeria uh, to address some of these uh, challenges that you know is up on the screen? I'm, I'm sure there are more, and perhaps some of it have been reduced. Uh, for example, the lack of civil reserve has been an ongoing debate and discussion uh, that is required to boost the, the group and it hasn't happened, is there any role 
uh, for the state to assist with this, um, to, to further strengthen the and to stop the institutional company, the, the greed from collapsing uh, in, the, in the fashion that we have seen uh, in recent past. Fati? Okay, hi. Um, um, thanks, Rahila. Let me just quickly go through them. Lack of spinning reserves, I don't think the states have anything to do with that. It's a matter of um, generation function and um, the fact that they have there's a procurement process and it has to be bidded and NERC has to superintend and agree on the cost of spinning reserves. So that's where we are now, is the procurement process and securing the spinning reserves. The interface is being handled by the SLA, as Jumoke has spoken about it. What can the state do about it? Um, really, I, I don't think they also have a role. Um, inadequate transmission capacity and stability, well, unless they have money to invest in um, transmission lines, um, uh, I don't know. I don't see that happening to post system dispatch. That also has risen to a lot of arguments is because TCN is one. The new bill, of course, um, envisages that, and it's always been there uh, in the EPSR Act as well, the separation between the tr transmission and the dispatch function. Uh, lack of integrated resource planning. That also, the new bill is actually working, well, it, has a, but it states that there will be um, a national integrated electricity policy and strategic implementation plan. By the whole, by the players in the sector that will be reviewed every five years, or as the need arises, when the minister recognizes that it's 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 it will be wonderful if you know we're good at making plans. Implementation is our problem, and um, when the players change in the key roles, they sort of tend to come with their own ideas. So it'd be nice to see if there's a plan that's going to be followed through. Um, it says right, yeah, that is where we need the states really. The right of way issues because land belongs to the states. They're the ones that can can take people away from the right of way. But of course, there's also that political will. I, I recall in a particular year we went. Yes, the power that was going through, we really needed to reconduct her, and they needed to clear people under the lines. But it was an election year, and the governor didn't want to lose a second term. So you know, there there are other things that feed feed into this sort of things. Um, vandalization that is another problem for us as well. And I'm happy to see that the new bill sets up some um, a fast track like a tax force because there are cases where we get vandals and because of course it's a criminal offense, we cannot prosecute. We have to depend on the public prosecutor and the police to prosecute our matters for us. So uh, there's a lot of challenges. So yes, um, um, there's local, um, there's also local enforcement. The states can actually have um, like sort of vigilante, you know, communities have to be sensitized. The government can sensitize communities on the effects of the vandalization. So yes, for right of way and vandalization, I see what states can do. Poor connection to distribution assets being handled by the SLA, hopefully. Um, lack of SCADA. Yeah, that has been um, elusive, but um, work is on the way. And I believe, of course, that if really um, you hive off the um, SO part from the transmission, really the real function for, for, for the ISO to be fully functional, not even fully, I mean, minimally functional, they need a SCADA. So that's all, even though TCN has an innovative way, they've done some IoT things, um, Internet of Things, to see part of the grid. But yes, TCM, SCADA is a must, and um, um, it's being worked on. So for states, I see that it's the right of way and the vandalization. Excellent. Um, I mean, you, you, talk, you mentioned ISO, uh, the independent system operator, which uh, will be um, carved out of TCN eventually, leaving just the wires and assets in, in TCN. Um, do you envisage then that with this amendment, constitutional amendment, we would have, for example, um, 10 ISOs. Would that uh, create a better structure for the decentralization that has occurred by this amendment? Do you think that is something, I mean, the, the, the electricity bill does not say that, but given this change, would it make it more effective to have regions or ISOs in different regions working uh, to ensure that there's open access for power developers in those areas to use the grid. It, would that make it more efficient? 
um, efficiency control, but Lagos has thought about it in their policy. They've actually thought of doing their own SO to dispatch within Lagos. Um, um, there's, there will still remain a national dispatch because there will be power, if you're going into bilaterals, there will be power bought from other places, from other states, and there will be exported excess power as well to other places. So the national ISO will still be there, yes. Within states, yes. If states actually do invest in generation, they will need their own local dispatch as well. Um, as we said, you know, there's a lot more questions than answers, and there's a lot of funding needed for all this. So how far this can go, um, your guess is as good as mine, honestly. I, I, certainly, most certainly. Do you care one minute on distribution? You don't have to take every point. I mean, I guess there are key ones there. We feel that we have the states can collaborate and support a distribution end of the business. So what I'll do is um, just run through what I think the states can do, you know, is and not okay. really address issues because the issues are clear. And so if um, by the time this takes off, the issue of tariffs is always a big discussion and lack of yes. interference and ensuring that the, the tariff is really cost reflective. I think that is important in creating any electricity market. The other issue is over-regulation. So for any investor that is coming in, you know, they want to ensure that you know, the lines are clear. Who is regulating me? And what are my obligations to that regulator? So it's not a case of, oh, now we have this opportunity. Rent seeking is the order of the day. And you, know, you try to just tax, you know, needlessly. We see that with in, in the distribution company where some states create a tax for you in particular. When you look at the description of that tax, you know that you are the only entity in that state that fits the tax. So you don't want rent seeking because that will make it difficult for investors, you know, to come in. Of course, avoidance of waste and parallel structures. No need to reinvent the wheel. It will build on existing structures, work with the existing market participants, create a framework that allows investments to come in. Respect sanctity of contracts. You know, some areas may have been franchised, investments have gone into some places. You, there is a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of room to play, you know, in terms of addressing the electrification issues, you know, within Nigeria and in the different states. So you don't have to go revoking, you know, things that already exist and a contract that have already, you know, come into place. And of course, the important thing is, um, blo over bloated projects, when the states start to play, states start to play in the electricity market, are those costs, are they efficient costs, are they prudent costs, are they, you know, yeah. uh, competitively sourced? Because everything will eventually end up in the tariff. So if you don't want a bloated tariff at the end of the day, then you must, from the get-go, begin to ensure that those projects that have been invested in are prudent and there are no overruns, you know, and things like that. Of course, states should pay their debts even electric for their electricity consumption. So it will be good for them to also develop a culture of wanting to pay and you know, continuously pay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Delano. Um, uh, Dolakpa, do you want to just you know, give us your thoughts in terms of how you feel the states can help with some of these challenges that, is, uh, that has plagued our sector for, uh, you know, for some time now and it's still on? Please. One minute, and then we'll take some questions from participants and wrap up. Thank you, Rahila. I'm not quite sure what happened at the last time when I was responding to the question, but just to finish up that question to say that okay, go ahead. Um, to, to Dean, that the states, the states haven't enacted laws yet. And so from a generation perspective, you are still subject to federal. Even if states enact their laws, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to take away what is on the federal level. However, we may get to a, sta a stage where, you know, there will have to be dichotomies. You know, there will yeah. have to be dichotomies. Who is generating? Who is regulating what? But we haven't gotten there yet. You are still regulated by federal. Okay. So going to the the slide, I would start with distribution because I think that states have a role, and I think it was mentioned here about the fact that, you know, um, states could, whether states could invest, you know, in, I think, I think we're talking about distribution. A lot of us know that states already have investments in distribution in a way. There are a number of states where, where it's actual state governments that build some of the distribution infrastructure. 
And I recall that during the privatization, there is actually a plan for states to take up shares in the distribution companies. So, so I think what we're talking about was states being able to acquire the discos, given that you know some the discos are in financial issues. So that's one. And we we probably will see that states having a role in distribution, even in this distribution companies. And that can be an organic way to deal with to, um, would I say cohabit within um this cohabit within states and within their regulation. That's mm. one. But that is distribution like now if you places like in the country i have personally been involved in states kind of being involved in to help drive or even the schools for example for every house having a meter is something that the state should be able to regulate you know, and that would help revenue assurance. You know, um, collection in expenses as well. The, the 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 metering should hopefully help. You know, with even collection in efficiency and and efficiencies. I also I also refer you know, stealing. You know, power theft, and I think yeah, in 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 that perspective, we just is a bit trickier. The general challenge is not they're not they are not things that can help with at state level. However, things like gas constraints, for example, honestly, for a state, except if a state is gas rich, that's the only way. If, yeah. if a state is gas rich and has access to that, states like River State, for example, River State is very gas rich. So that may be something mm -hmm. in which on at you know that in their state. And for for and dispatches is, is again within the states and it depends on the state. But things like the pocket and capacity. One of the things that this whole thing is going to throw up is capacity. You know, even in the, in the, um, the general, in, we can say that we have full capacity people who have the depth of knowledge. I think that we have a very rich depth of knowledge for, for a country, you know, but it's mm -hmm. going to even open up more opportunities. I'll stop there. Thank you, um, thank you, Delaco. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I wish uh, Joy was uh, on this call. Uh, she's still, I mean, it's unfortunate that we, we, we are not able to have her from here to speak on generation as it were. Um, she just said she what did she, what did she say? I mean, I can't, I can't see her, unfortunately. Um, so the last, I think the question for me, and, and I can see one of the participants is uh, what we have on the screen. Um, so discourse are set, and of course, Delano, this is, this is for you. It says that discourse are set an exclusive right uh, to their franchise area, and since privatization, they have continued to make capital expenditures there as required to meet the, perform the key performance indicators set by the regulator. How will the state participation impact this good operation and revenue requirements, revenue, uh, requir revenue uh, recovery? I mean, before us here, some of the terms uh, in the distribution license that could, could imply that there's uh, some exclusive right. Some have argued that there's no excuse with, uh, exclusive right by the discourse. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? And of course, just to add to this, because there's a similar question by participants. Uh, the person is saying, um, with these amendments, who owns the customers in each disco coverage area? How may these affect the willingness of states to invest or partner with others in power infrastructure development? Um, okay, so of um, exclusivity has been widely debated, you know, on whether discos have a, an exclusive right to their franchise or coverage areas. And you know, if you look through the agreements, while no specific clause, you know, points to ex exclusivity, but you can see that the expectations, the KPIs, the investments, as mentioned, the investments that were made by the um, investors was in respect of the whole coverage area, not just the part. And the key performance indicators that were set, reporting requirements that were imposed on uh, the distribution companies 
are for, for the coverage area. So whilst it will not have been explicitly stated, there is a legitimate expectation where you are expected to report and comply for um, the whole coverage area. So um, how will state participation impact those operations? I would think uh, I've said that before. It is important to collaborate so that the whole sector is not thrown into, you know, disputes and you know, uh, litigation and lawsuits, because there is enough opportunity for all players, you know, to be able, you know, to um, to realize the end goal of having a viable and thriving electricity market that can, you know, potentially impact e economic development and drive. In the nation as a whole, you know, forward. That's the way I see it. Thank you. Makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, I think uh, this is nine minutes past twelve. I know we started late, um, and um, I think I would like each panelist to have to give one minute talk on this whole uh, amendment um, to the constitution. Um, if you were, I mean, by May 29th, we'll have uh, 20 minutes of the new administration. And I was wondering that if you had the opportunity uh, to stand, you know, uh, before, uh, the, you know, whoever, you know, would uh, take charge of power development with respect to this change, what would be your advice or your, your thoughts to that person in improvement as we transition to a new administration? Dolakwa, let's start with you. I, I think it's interesting that um, if I was to advise the coming administration, I would say, I'd say enable Merck to be able to be to lead on this process. We will still get to the point. Right. I also say that what that would because you invest we can't uh, unfortunately that mess to go for to the federal level at the state level. We need to be proved that it needs to down. I don't know if you what have the last, okay, you're, you're a bit patchy, Delacro. It's, it's, it's a bit patchy. We can we can barely hear you, Delacro. But thank you. I'll go to the next panelist. Patty, do you want do you have any party in uh, comments uh, for participants and uh, perhaps the new administration? If you had the opportunity to be uh, called to advice on this, what would be your party in for your advice? My advice is that there has to be very strong political will and um, taking through the plan and there has to be a plan actually um, um, T uh, Merck will have to take their rightful position and whoever becomes the minister should be able to drive the sector to achieving whatever it is that is agreed so the new government has a lot on their hands and they need very serious people working on it and there should not be any policy somersaults thank you do you want to go ahead? Looks like Rahila went off. Okay, so for me, um, I think building on what um, Fatima said and what you've said, Dolapo, I would say collaborate. It's important and there is no need to reinvent the wheel. The essence is to assess where we are and what has worked and what has not worked. And let's build, you know, based on our assessment of what has worked and what has not worked. So there is need for collaboration or at the National Assembly on the new law that is coming out. There's a need for collaboration at federal and state level on the electricity uh, laws that will emerge from the states. And of course, there's a need for collaboration between states and the existing licensees. It's important. Thank you. We can't hear you, Rahila. You're we muted. can't hear you, Rahila. I didn't know I was muted. Thank you so, so much um, uh, to our distinguished panelists and attendees for joining us today.
uh, for this very important discussion on state participation in the Nigeria power sector. Um, obviously, we have gained valuable insights into the new powers granted to the states from our panelists as a result of the constitutional amendment, which enables them to operate in areas covered by the national grid. As we have seen, this uh, constitutional amendment has the potential to bring about significant changes to the power sector, with states now able to take a more active role in ensuring reliable and efficient electricity supply to their citizens. No doubt, based on the conversation and the contributions we've had today from our panelists, that co collaboration and coordination will be key to achieving the desired outcomes of improved electricity access and increased investment in the sector. We certainly look forward to seeing the positive impact of state participation in the power sector in the years to come. We hope that this webinar has been informative and has provided you with the knowledge and understanding necessary to navigate the evolving la uh, legal landscape. Uh, thank you once again, distinguished panelists. I'm honored to have you know, moderated this session and, and, and I believe that uh, the, um, the uh, audience are more informed. Uh, thank you once again for joining us and we look forward to continuing the conversation in the nearest future. Thank you very much. And, and have a very good day, uh, panelists, as you go to your uh, different offices. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.